Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the free AWP webinar series. Um, we've got another uh, installation here for you with a couple of sponsors of the upcoming AWP conference. We've got Brands and Insight AWP. Um, they've joined us today to talk a little bit about their participation at the conference and uh, a topic that they know uh, a lot about um, access, in particular scaffolding as it relates to an AWP and, and WFP system. So uh, without further ado, we'll just get, uh, we'll get started. Uh, the question that they'll be tackling today is, what does it take to support the process of workface planning? And uh, before we get going, uh, we're gonna introduce the speakers to you and, uh, and companies involved here. But um, just so you know, um, toward the end of the presentation, we're going to have a Q&A uh, portion. So you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions of the presenters. And um, we'll also be sending a recording of this out to all the attendees. So you can reference the, the presentation later if you like, and you can feel free to send send either us or, or the presenters a, a message directly if you have more questions or if you want to talk a little bit more about, about topics uh, around access. Um, you can submit your questions by hitting the raise hand button on your attendee panel or you can send it via the chat window or um, there, you should see a Q&A button on the, uh, on the panel as well. Any one of those will work just fine. If you use the raise hand feature, we can send you the microphone basically and you can speak directly to the uh, to the presenters here which you might find to be a little more efficient um, we'll also give you a, a quick little preview of the AWP conference 2018 that's happening in uh, Houston Texas again this year uh, October 2nd and 3rd and we do thank Insight AWP and Brand Safeway uh, for their ongoing support of the conference though the returning sponsors this year and, and they've been uh, coming back year after year uh, to give uh, to deliver some great content for us at the event. So, um, your your speakers today are Jeff Ryan from Insight AWP. He's an AWP specialist, and Rick Dunlap um, of Brand Safeway. He's a VP Technical Services, and I won't speak for them. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and uh, and pass uh, the microphone over to to Insight uh, Jeff Ryan. Hey, thanks very much, Stephen, um, and uh, good morning to everybody who's listening. Um, welcome to uh, another another webinar of, uh, of AWP, um, and uh, actually a really good um, uh, format, I thought, to uh, help us get warmed up to the uh, the conference. Um, uh, so that, uh, of course, when we get to the conference, we're uh, full of questions, and um, and uh, we can drill down right down into the right subjects. Uh, so anyway, um, um, uh, um, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, our company. For anybody who uh, we haven't uh, haven't been working with yet, um, Inside AWP is established in 2006. We are implementation specialists. Uh, typically, we work for the owners, and um, we um, help the owner. Um, and develop or the owners contractors develop their AWP competency. Uh, we've been involved in uh, coming up to 35 pre mega projects now in Canada, the US, um, Europe, and Australia. Uh, we've uh, collected a couple of industry awards along the way uh, with uh, from COA and from Bentley and Hexagon for using their software. Um, and we have um, uh, authored uh, two uh, industry guidebooks on the process of uh, both workface planning and AWP. I'll uh, give you an idea of the size of the company. We currently have 15 staff on six active projects um, in three different countries. So that's sort of uh, where AWP is right now. You click on the next slide there for me. Ah, thanks, Steve. Okay, so let's talk about um, uh, scaffold and how that fits into the world of uh, uh, advanced work packaging. So. Essentially, what we're going to talk about today is the construction portion of AWP. So we're talking about the workface planning portion of uh, the advanced work packaging process. Very important to note that uh, the workface planning process is governed by information tools, materials, and access. Um, and uh, you know that's a standard that's been around for uh, 40 or 50 years now. That everybody understands that that's what it takes to actually get things done. 
Our focus today is going to be on access. Really, how do you get uh, or how do you develop a process that allows uh, workers to have access to the workface? So, of course, managing uh, this constraint is uh, a significant portion of um, workforce planning. And I often thought that this was actually the difference between a lot of the ways that we conduct construction in the past and what we do now in a workforce planning environment. We've had plans before, but the real difference and the real um, juice that we see on a, a project when, a, when when things really start to go well is when we start to manage constraints. And uh, of course, uh, scaffold is one of those key constraints. So uh, certainly the next point on the slide here is talking about the cost of scaffold. Now, a um, couple of things that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the uh, cost of not having a scaffold and also the cost of um, of actual scaffolding, so that is the uh, the manpower and the, the cost of rentals of scaffold. Um, our primary focus today is the cost of not having scaffolds, or the cost of, or the process of not getting to that point where you are um, uh, experiencing that cost. Because uh, ultimately, if you don't have a scaffold, uh, that creates delays and um, uh, issues in the field that is uh, much bigger. Uh, impact on uh, productivity and cost than the cost of the scaffold. Now, that only happens, of course, when um, or the the process of getting scaffolds built before we need them only happens if uh, the rest of the project is organised. I know that uh, we've worked on several projects with Brand now, and um, we've seen situations where uh, we have been very organised, and uh, the mechanical trades have had all the packages in place. They have had a, an overall plan for how they want to use scaffold. Uh, each package has a description of exactly what the scaffolding requirements are. Um, and uh, that enables uh, a system like the brand system to be effective. We've also been on projects where uh, the scaffold team have been trying really hard to be effective and to plan, but the mechanical trades didn't plan and the result was the scaffold has failed, or basically it wasn't. You know, the the scaffold budgets were blown out, and uh, and and the projects are basically crippled because then we try to manage the scaffold budget by not building scaffolds, which makes things worse. So anyway, um, so I guess the point of that is that when we talk about scaffold management, it really does come down to having the mechanical trades build plans and have being organised in order to build a foundation that allows uh, scaffold management to happen. Um, now, uh, talking about scaffold labour costs, um, we've seen, uh, we've had really good projects that came in at 18%, uh, so that is 18% of the direct workforce. So uh, 18 people out of every 100 in the field were scaffolders. And we've also had projects where 40 people out of every 100 in the field were scaffolders. Basically, they're the same projects, um, and it's not that you need more scaffold on one or the other. It's just the uh, the result of being organised or not. Um, if you build scaffolds and you tear them down, then you build them again. You tear them down, you build them again, uh, or you build them in the wrong places and you have to modify them uh, because you are not planned or organised. Then, of course, your scaffold costs go go up. So uh, uh, by itself, that is a, uh, um, a big impact. Uh, but to the last point on this slide, uh, managing scaffold cost is not the target. Um, the target is to make sure that we have scaffolds before we need them. And that's really, really important. Uh, because as soon as you start to try to squeeze the cost of scaffold, um, you forget the big cost of not having them. Can you pop the next slide there for me, please, Steve? So let's have a look at um, um, what that looks like, or what the process looks like there. So essentially what we do in an environment where we have mechanical trades building uh, installation work packages, they're one week each, and they're um, ideally uh, they're being uh, uh, developed to the point where they have materials and documents, and then they enter a, a pool or a bucket or a backlog, and they sit in that backlog until they enter the three week look ahead. Um, as they enter the three-week look ahead, that's a flag for us to uh, do a couple of things. Uh, we uh, typically send a request to the material management group and say, okay, hey, uh, we have told you about this um, this package that was going to happen. You've probably got it already bagged and tagged. Well, three weeks from now, we're going to be asking you to deliver it. Uh, 
so it's sort of a, a heads up for the material group. Exactly the same thing happens for scaffold, where um, we have had an overall scaffold plan that we did at the start of the project, where we all sat down and we walked through the model and tried to figure out, hey, where should we have dance floors and where should we have stair access points and sort of the big scaffold plan. Um, and then as each of the IWPs was created by the mechanical contractor, we also went to, okay, if we're going to do this weld, we're going to need a scaffold or we're going to need access to this weld. So uh, that becomes a scaffold request. That sits with the IWP until it hits the three-week look-ahead. Once it does that, the workforce planner pulls that request out, sends it over to the scaffold management team. So in the perfect world, uh, and when this does work, and we, we, we've seen this work many times, the scaffolders get uh, almost three weeks notice for when they need to build that, uh, that scaffold. And that seems to be okay. That seems to be uh, enough time for the scaffolders to uh, get themselves organized and get that scaffold built. Uh, just about 100% uh, of the time. Um, we found that the scaffolds that didn't get built on time were usually the ones that were submitted late. So uh, if we can follow this rule, we can we can just about always get our scaffold on time. Pretty simple process then that the scaffold request comes in, goes to the scaffold company. I'm just following the flow chart now. Uh, the scaffold company planner assigns a number. You know, Ideally, that's coming from a database. There's, inside the database, there is... Um, a line item now that says oh, we're going to build this scaffold, it's associated with this uh, initial IWP. Um, the um, software that, um, that brand use and uh, that is available um, is, uh, calculates the, uh, the number of components that you will need to build that scaffold, so uh, it will give you a material list um, and then um, uh, so that, that, that lives in the scaffold database. And uh, Rick will talk more about uh, calculating the cost of scaffold. Uh, but of course, um, once you have a line item, you have the material that you need for it, then you can start to calculate the cost. For our benefit, um, all we want to know is that we're going to get it. So the scaffold companies uh, put together uh, or put together uh, five or six or eight uh, uh, scaffold plans, put them into an IWP and give that to a, uh, a scaffold foreman and say, here, this is your work for the week. So he's got an IWP, he can pick up his scaffold material, direct the scaffolds, give the feedback to the planner, and the planner gives the feedback to the workforce planner to say, hey, the scaffold is complete. Ideally, that's a week or so before uh, we need it. Uh, we've talked to the foreman and told him that he's getting this package next week um, and that the scaffold is built and he should go over and have a look at it and uh, make sure that it is fit for purpose. Not rocket science, um, uh, and I know what I just described uh, uh, sounds pretty simple, um, but for anybody that's been in a situation where you don't have an organized approach to building scaffolds, it's nothing like that. Um, I know when I was in the field, that was basically just a, a point and do uh, process where um, uh, you, you, you know, asked scaffolders to build scaffolders as quick, quickly as they could and then you stood by and watched while they built them uh, until you could go to work. And that's a really um, um, detrimental process. Okay, uh, Steve, can you pop the next slide there, please? Okay, so how do you get there? So first of all, if we're going to be planners and we're going to be good at it, we have to have our own plan. And um, of course, that comes down to having a procedure or a scaffold, uh, integrating scaffold with our other procedures. Uh, that's really important, and that's something that uh, that we try to do as often as possible. And of course, once you've done that, and you've set up a process that orders scaffold, and uh, that gets scaffold built before you need it, you also need to monitor it. So you need some mechanism that says, okay, this is how many scaffolds we've got built. Uh, this is how many. Uh, still standing, uh, this is when they're going to be pulled down, that whole process of, of management. And from that you need to pull data that tells you the health of the project. So um, ideally of course when we're talking about scaffold, the health of the scaffold is actually the backlog. Um, if there is a healthy backlog uh, of scaffolds that is uh, that needs to be um, uh, erected over the next uh, two weeks or so. Uh, that allows the scaffold companies, first of all, to resource level, so they're not up and down in their resource uh, adjustments, um, but also, of course, um, um, allows them a little bit of time to make sure that all those scaffolds get done in, in that period of time. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, that's uh, that's our 
uh, requirements as workforce planners for a scaffold management program. And uh, with that, maybe I'll hand over to Rick and he can tell you uh, what he does when he gets one of our requests. Okay. Um, thanks very much, uh, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, participate in the webinar and thanks for your time. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Jeff, uh, specifically his teams that we worked with on previous projects. Uh, fully understand AWP and WFP and fully understand some of the challenges that uh, being a scaffold craft or access craft provider uh, can present. And he's helped us solve a lot of those problems over the last 10 years. Uh, so kudos to Jeff and uh, look forward to many more uh, successful projects. We're going to cover a couple today that uh, we actually worked with Jeff on. So real quickly, uh, my background, I've uh, been a contractor uh, all my life, essentially, my professional life. Uh, I really enjoy project management, project control, focused on that, and AWP and WFP uh, over the last five or 10 years has really opened my eyes to why we could never get some of the results from everyone's planning, everyone has project controls, we're still not getting the results. And, the answer is very straightforward and described very well in AWP and WFP. So go ahead, um, Stephen. So quickly on Brand Safeway. Um, Brand Safeway is a, a large organization, um, about five billion in revenue, uh, thirty countries today, probably, give or take one or two, um, thirty thousand plus employees. And the point of this slide is that. We do lots of stuff, but about half our business is truly access and scaffold related. So this topic is very near and dear to uh, our hearts. Go ahead, Steve. So to kind of to kind of talk about how we as a scaffold provider have been challenged over the last five or ten years with the evolution of mega or giga projects is, as Jeff described earlier, is Many times a client has, uh, our client, we work directly for uh, owners, we work directly for EPCs, we work for uh, agents of owners and or agents of EPCs to deliver uh, access services. But one of the challenges that we saw uh, over the last five or 10 years is the evolution of mega projects. We've seen the scaffold budgets uh, balloon and balloon and balloon. Uh, and get really out of control. And unfortunately for us, uh, we kind of kind of got caught by that. Uh, we couldn't explain it. We didn't quite understand it, why we were uh, over budget. And when we started to dig in and understand it, the, the AWP WFP model pretty clearly illuminated it and said, hey, just because we have scaffold or access in our name or offering doesn't mean we're driving the cost. Okay. Um, that said, how do I how do I help facilitate our clients in providing a process, and how do I help facilitate our teams in understanding how to work with our clients and their agents in this process, and and deliver effective access service. So, what we've done is we've built uh, we've built their own. Uh, piece of software. You don't necessarily need that piece of software, but the software is very valuable to us. It helps us create a our own internal work package for scaffold or access, whether the client is in an AWP or WFP mode. And so that's what we call brand net. So it works really straightforward, provides some visualizations, which are very powerful for the teams. When someone says, I need a 10 by 10 scaffold with one deck, um, it's very intuitive to look at the picture and say, yes, in fact, that is a 10 by 10 scaffold with one deck and it has 92 parts and here's what the parts are and I can stage those parts very efficiently and do a good job when the client sends me a radio call and says I need a scaffold right away. So I can do those things, but the, the really powerful piece is when you start talking about the last five or 10 years, the evolution of the 3D space and design models. Now that I have a design model, I can actually 
concept that scaffold request or that scaffold plan that's coming three days or three weeks ahead of time, Jeff. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's three hours and, or three days. Three, three weeks is beautiful, but regardless, if I have some runway of time, I can integrate that scaffold design into the model and say, Mr. Scaffold Requester, is this in fact what you need uh, to access for your work? And becomes really powerful, not only for us, but also for the access users. And then lastly, uh, whether I'm in, in new construction or brownfield uh, tie-ins or uh, even a maintenance or turnaround environment, we want to create the ability to do the same thing that we've done with 3D models in, say, an asphalt space. So laser scanning and uh, uh, photogrammetry and some of those things have become very powerful for us in workface planning and AWP efforts on turnarounds as well as run and maintain work. So go ahead, Steven. So here's kind of the crux of the issue for me, and I put a capital timeline, a very simplistic capital timeline up and said, typical timeline is someone has an idea, hey, let's build a really big chemical plant or a really big uh, downstream facility. Um, let's do a feasibility study. Uh, how are we gonna really do this? It goes, it gets funded, it goes to feed. There's some, uh, you know, detailed feed that happens. Then the commercial folks get engaged and say, how are we gonna actually go build this now? Come up with a commercial strategy. Usually their strategy is, hey, everything's gonna be lump sum, so we mitigate our risk. That's fantastic. Uh, they tender a bid out in the open market. They get three bids for access and for every other service. And uh, they find the low bidder and they award it. And four weeks later, we're in the field building scaffold. That approach is self defeating in the long run, uh, especially on mega projects and giga projects, because those mitigation strategies or commercial strategies that are applied typically force silos and typically force us to operate as external parties to the project. And when you when you think about that, that limits our ability to really impact the job other than in the construction management and execution piece as a scaffold provider. In other words, your lump sum contractor one comes in and says, hey, I need a scaffold. You're providing, you know, uh, the client's providing the scaffold. I need it right away. That in and, in and of itself is a commercial strategy driving uh, cost into the job, uh, self-defeating. What we can do though is we can use our, our system and our approach and our knowledge of AWP and WFP and do that as efficiently as possible. But the reality is, is if we were part of the project earlier on uh, in that feed stage somewhere or that path to construction strategy, constructability piece, we could identify numerous opportunities to say, there's some alternative approaches to hand-to-mouth scaffolds. Uh, how about we do uh, decking systems instead of piece-by-piece -piece scaffolds times 5,000 scaffolds uh, to provide access to all your crafts, uh, much better access, much more feasible for them to do their intended work. And by the way, we do it at much less cost. So those are some ideas that typically are great and can happen on a spot basis um, if we're in the project late. But if we're in the project early, we can actually identify a lot of those opportunities and make a decent impact. And we've done that a couple of times where clients have actually modified their structural steel designs to include tabs for deck systems to hang on, uh, various other items. And not only in the construction phase, but if you think about the cost of ownership once the plan is operational, provides them with a natural way uh, to take advantage of that same work phase planning AWP approach for their run and maintain or program work. But the real the real opportunity is is if we're part of the planning team on site or part or we're embedded as part of that process as just slide described pretty nicely, it allows us to basically say, Here's the work phase. Who all is going to work in this work phase over the next 60 days, 90 days, or throughout the project? 
can can I build one or two or three scaffolds instead of 10 or 20 or 100 scaffolds? Uh, and when I do that, I start to really take out a lot of the non tool time and I start to take out the waste of functional silos driven by commercial strategy. Lump sum contractor one, lump sum contractor two, calling and requesting their own scaffolds for their own specific scope of work. That's driving cost into the job. So taking a hold of access at a global level and managing access for all crafts provides numerous opportunities to take lots of waste out of the process. In fact, the biggest bucket of waste. So think of it as three channels of value that your access provider can, can deliver. Better innovative ways to reduce the number of hours required for scaffold and to improve the efficiency of the access users when they're in the field. So that's bucket one. Bucket two is truly that work phase planning AWP approach in the center where instead of flat 2D pieces of paper saying I need a scaffold or a radio call the day of, I actually have a planned approach. We understand the construction path of construction and we can build optimized scaffolds for the intended uh, craft work. And then lastly, um, our teams, when we do build it, we have our, we already have a plan. We can pre-kit scaffolds. Uh, we can um, validate plans instead of creating plans and the day of provides numerous opportunities. So think of it again as three channels. Go ahead, Stephen. So as a as a sample, uh, real client, I don't want to name names, but in fact, we participated in the work phase planning um, AWP process for a new unit build. We sat with construction management leaders by discipline, did model reviews scope by scope. Um, and, and historically, this is done with, say, a P6 schedule, someone would create a P6 schedule, identify all the activities by all the disciplines, lay that into a piece of a paper and send it to us and say, hey, I need a budget. Instead of that approach, we, we actually used that approach uh, to start with and then improved it as we went. So we laid out uh, 850 scaffolds and when we were done, we had narrowed it down to maybe 500 scaffolds because we identified numerous requests in the P6 schedule for scaffolds in the same exact spot. And when we were able to use that 3D space, we're able to say, I don't need a scaffold on top of a scaffold. I need a scaffold that accommodates both these scopes of work or these four or five scopes of work. And when I do that, I eliminate uh, all the travel time, all the material logistics, all the safety process, all the modifications in the field while people are standing by and watching it was a win-win. So just an example of how this can be used ahead of time. And this work package is, is what we create for each and every tag when we use the system. Um, in addition to the, to the uh, documents shown on the screen, there's, there's numerous times where client documents, uh, the IWP system documents, as an example, we're working with uh, Bentley on a couple of projects now and uh, their construction product, and we're actually in their IWP system. Uh, we're uploading our package. We're including certain client documents as well as project-specific documents as part of the package. So there's lots of ways to add value, and I think uh, this is an illustration of one way to do that early in. Go ahead, Stephen. So. A specific project that we worked with Jeff's team on, um, and we're working with the sister to this project now. So over the last couple of years, we've been involved with Insight on some very successful projects. And I would say that uh, the, the uh, DFL hours that Jeff mentioned, I would say we actually beat those on one of those projects. So I know he doesn't want to advertise that, but um, I'm not going to say sandbagging, but we can actually improve the numbers that he stated as well. So at, at what, we're, what we're illustrating here is the classic AWP model, how our simplistic three channels of value, strategy, constructability, trace planning, 
and the construction management execution piece really line up with that. And we do that to make it easy for our teams to understand and consume. And once they get that concept, then uh, adding on the formal pieces becomes very easy. The takeaway for this uh, slide is really what you see is an actual work package used on an actual job. You can see about 25 scopes listed out on a piece of paper, those uh, behind the picture. Those vary from mechanical or piping equipment, fireproofing, and a couple of others. The point is, is individually, each of those contractors would have called and requested a scaffold. We would have had a field, field supervision resource do the best that they could do and say, hey, there's already a scaffold there, I can do a modification. Hey, there's not a scaffold there, I've got to go build it. Or um, that scaffold's been there for months, just use that one. Uh, you don't need a scaffold, maybe use a scissor lift, those kind of discussions. And what happens in that scenario is it comes down to that individual being able to manage not only um, the culture of that job site, but just the raw quantity of how many times he gets asked to do that, and how many times he can keep up with those details in his head. So we like to say, let's take a very repeatable process, let's validate it in a 3D space where we can, and let's eliminate as much of that load on the supervision to do planning for other crafts. Let's do it, let's, let's put this back on them to do their planning. So in this case, uh, this started out as 10 scaffolds and it ended up being three. And the reason it became three is we were able to work with um, a AWP consultant like Jeff's team and the contractors involved, the actual access users, had to comply with the process because the owner was championing the process. And when you do that, we could actually apply all three channels. And the next slide illustrates the scaffold pretty nicely. Steve, if you'll change. In fact, what we saw in that exact scaffold was 10 individual scaffolds requested by three or four different crafts in the same general area. We translated that to three scaffolds, two large ones and one small one. If I'm, if I'm managing scaffold as an individual contractor, I don't wanna pay for that great big one, but the client said, oh, I get it. I can now do one big scaffold instead of five small scaffolds. I save money and the math is very straightforward. It's not rocket science. <clears throat> the 10 individual scaffolds in the best scenario without any delays would have said at 50% tool time, which is probably a good average for industry that has some maturity model to it, says I'm gonna eliminate seven travels, seven material logistics, seven permits, um, seven uh, waste opportunities essentially and just by doing that, I've eliminated a large amount of hours associated with the scaffold crap. Okay, so Stephen, you'll switch. So that, that illustration is rolled up into an actual project control deck that we, um, we share quite a bit with this client that we worked with, but also uh, others in the industry to say, we did a front end planning job with this client. We identified as best we could, as many scopes as we could to say, this will be our project baseline with some contingency and we're gonna manage that. We started the work and just using our work packaging system along with Jeff's team at the site, we were able to beat our productivity uh, estimate for the project. We didn't pay for the productivity, which is illustrated in the cost of productivity chart, essentially man hour cost. The chart that really kind of uh, made the case with the client and made the case for the job site and really solidified their journey uh, on AWP was the chart on the left, which we call quality or modifications. And I couldn't have described it much better, but we started the project and within days, uh, the multiple stakeholders coming into the site, all the various contractors on various commercial strategies. So hey, I need my scaffold, you're providing scaffold, I need it right away. I need a 10 by 10, here's the radio. So time out, you need to participate in the actual scaffold planning process. Well, I don't have time for that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm here to, I'm here to hang pipe and I'm here to pull cable for electrical. That's all, I'm, that's all I care about. 
said, fine, um, documented that. Within four weeks of starting the project, 40% of the man hours on the job site were for scaffold modifications because people said, I'm here to hang pipe. I don't care about scaffold. And the result was our scaffold teams can't read their minds on what they truly needed. So we're left to build it uh, as described on a piece of paper or a subway napkin. And the result was the clients footing the bill. So um, the other point I would make right here is that left unchecked within eight weeks, that chart's very linear. The gray curve that's shown on quality modifications would have been at 80%. Nothing was going to change that behavior until the client and the workface planning team intervened and said, I'm out, guys. This is exactly why we did front end planning. So, on a capital project, if your budgets are double what you intended, I would look at this bucket right here to say, How do I stop driving modifications and scaffold rebuilds into my work? And the answer is the access users have to be held accountable to do a better job planning for scaffold as a constraint in their work. Very straightforward. Okay. Um, to kind of to kind of wrap up uh, again, I want to make a, a couple of sermon points here, but I've lobbied very hard over the last few years to say <clears throat> I cannot name one craft that is involved in everyone else's scopes of work more than I can for access. Access is viewed as a constraint, which means it's not as important as the pipe or the electric, uh, electrical cabling. But it actually is because without it, they can't do their work effectively. Um, I think access should be considered a discipline on um, client projects, especially mega projects. And Without a global oversight on access, you'll never um, you'll never win all the food fights between the various contractors. So it has to be pulled apart, uh, pulled out of their scope somehow, and it has to be managed globally. Um, as Jeff mentioned, he's seen ratios of, of scaffold on um, projects 18 to um, 40 percent. I use 30 as a round number. Uh, we've seen results below 15. We've seen results uh, lower than that even. When we have a very mature project team, we have a client team uh, that understands what we're trying to accomplish, the results are there to be had. Um, the, 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 the main thing that I can, that I would like to convey as to why your scout cost is high is the fact that allowing individual mechanical crafts or others to dictate how and when scaffolds are built without any accountability to that plan is driving your cost up. And so if you take a global approach to access and you engage a qualified access provider who has knowledge and capabilities and a team sport mentality, um, you can deliver value on your jobs and take hours of scaffold hours out of the process through better strategy constructability reviews. You can take a substantial amount of your hours out by um, forcing your uh, access users and your provider together in 3D space, doing some work space planning and eliminating the number of scaffolds required to be built eliminating the number of modifications required for actual scaffolds built and eliminating the need for scaffold rebuilds of the same exact scaffold. One of the things that Jeff points out to us a lot is that if, if you're challenged with say scaffold rent and you want to know um, should I tear the scaffold down or should I let it stay up, the math is very simple especially for us, if we're in an AWP, WFP environment, we should know once that plan is created, what the break even is in terms of days, uh, how long that scaffold should stand or can stand before it makes more sense to tear it down. It's a very economic, very straightforward cost benefit analysis. There are some extending items that come into play there, which would be, uh, I have space issues or I have safety concerns or others, but 
uh, the economic piece is very straightforward. That uh, this following this process allows you to do that very simplistically. And then lastly, um, I would say we've held ourselves accountable to provide a process to help our clients understand where their scalpel money is going. But we're also holding ourselves accountable to deliver to a plan that's very detailed. Whether I'm in a T&M environment, a lump sum environment, a unit price environment, it does not matter to us. It's math. Um, but we're willing to do that, and we feel much more confident when we operate in these type projects in this type environment with AWP, WFP, that we can achieve the intended target. So I, I covered it a little different than Jeff, but um, that kind of high level will go into much more detail uh, at the, at the uh, seminar in uh, October here in Houston. But uh, that concludes what I had. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, to Rick and, and Jeff. I um, thought that was a, a very good overview and um, I'm sure it doesn't go into nearly as much as depth as, uh, as either of these, these guys could uh, in the time that we have allotted. But uh, fortunately, we do have time remaining for some Q&A. If anybody want, does want to dive a little bit deeper into the topic, um, Feel free to submit your question again through the Q&A or through the chat or, or raise your hand and, and you can speak with, uh, with Jeff, Jeff and Rick. Hey Steve, uh, I have a question to kick us off if you like. Sure, go for it. Hey um, uh, Rick, um, uh, Brain do this on projects with and without workspace planning. Um, do you guys have any numbers on that? I know that they, first of all, you know, the graph you showed us was really good. Uh, that's uh, uh, that by itself tells us that there's a huge difference when you get organised. Um, anyway, just uh, just thinking out loud about uh, do we have something sort of more across the industry to show us what that um, impact might be? Well, it's uh, I have a few, and I'll I'll, I'll use the graph that was shown. Um, that that project was essentially a five million dollar project. It was part of uh, a systematic upgrade by the client, which you're well aware of. Uh, the sister project to that, to this job that I, that I highlighted, was done in another city, another location, another project team, but essentially the same amount of uh, stuff to be done. That project came in at over $10 million for scaffold costs. Ours came in at $5 million. So, um, as, you, as you also know, um, so thanks for the thanks for the softball. But as you also know, the client team we worked with on the charts that we illustrated didn't. They're continuing their capital projects as they go, and we're both included in the next set of projects for that exact reason because they saw real value. Um, I, one one color commentary on that topic too, I would add is um, we told the client they're. AFE should be about five million. Uh, they doubled it uh, because scaffolds always double. And then when we finished the job, they had several million dollars to apply SAP to other areas of the project. So um, created some new and unique challenges for our clients. It's, That's a uh, good problem. It does work. Yeah, it does work. Okay, we have a question here. Um, in addition to scaffolding solutions, do you also provide solutions for construction crane for heavy lifts? Okay, um, is that one for me then, Steve? Uh, I suppose either. Uh, you go, you I'll, can start. I'll tag, on, I'll tag on the end of Jeff's because uh, we're working okay. one of those now. Sure. Okay, yeah, so uh, exactly the same. You know, if you don't have a crane and you need one, uh, you've got a problem. So uh, it is a constraint on doing work. Um, it is a resource that gets applied to work uh, in an ideal situation. Of course, the reality is that uh, our projects don't work that way. Um, a superintendent would normally get a crane and that's his crane and he can do whatever he likes with it. And uh, of course, that is a, um, a uh, not a very effective system. Um, in um, 
a couple of projects that we have uh, managed to uh, get on top of this. Uh, the uh, cranes get assigned essentially to work packages just like we would um, scaffold or materials where uh, we essentially say, okay, if we're going to execute this work, we're going to need this lifting capacity um, and uh, then that comes down into a, a daily meeting where the uh, superintendents are looking at a whiteboard and uh, we've got, this is the total uh, equipment that's available. Uh, this guy gets it in the morning, this guy gets it in the afternoon um, uh, because it's uh, um, essentially um, been assigned or, or uh, the work has been identified to have that requirement. So um, yes, we can do it. Um, it's not quite as um, upfront as scaffold, uh, mainly because the reality of um, uh, lifting and executing work is you can't see a week ahead of time whether you need it in the morning or the afternoon. So you need to live a little closer uh, hand to mouth there. But uh, certainly um, you can manage cranes and you can stop them from being a problem. So, so I'll, I'll add on. So Jeff, that's, that's dead on from my perspective, but um, just to give a little simpler, maybe a more of a battle ax approach is uh, as a scaffold provider, one of the challenges we run into is we build some pretty large scaffolds uh, occasionally. Uh, we build them in tight areas. Uh, the cranes come in to do their stuff, and the first thing you find out is they've got to rotate 30 degrees. They've got to boom out uh, X feet, and the next thing you know, we're doing scaffold teardowns to accommodate the crane and the lift and all that process. So. Uh, where where the rubber meets the road to just comments, that's where we see it as an impact. So uh, what we've what we've done recently with a couple of uh, clients, very large projects on the west coast. Um, it, this happens to be a turnaround event. We actually took uh, their 25 cranes, various sizes, the models of those cranes, as accurate as uh, we could be to scale. Uh, place those in the work face uh, planning environment uh, in the 3D model and did some rotation, did some booms, identified some trouble areas and reduced uh, the number of scaffold modifications due to cranes from, from uh, dozens per uh, event to one. Uh, so we took a substantial amount of cost out. We spent some time planning for that, uh, but very successful. So we have another question here. Um, on the first slide that showed the labor percentage for scaffolding, one was cost and the other was hours. Should they both have been in hours? Uh, is that uh, your slide there, Rick? Is that what we're talking about? It's possible I could... Uh, Speak. Uh, that question was from John. Uh, John, would you be interested in elaborating, maybe uh, with the microphone or? Sure. Yeah, I will say that typically we we don't talk about dollars as much as uh, hours. But of course, when you are talking about uh, the 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 cost mm -hmm. of a, a six foot beam, it, it comes in dollars. Sure, John, do you wanna speak? Yes, uh, how do I turn on my mic? Uh, we can hear you, we can hear you now. Okay, cool. Yeah, on the first slide, it talked about the percentages, 18 to 40%. One of them said cost, the other one said hours. I would think that it's, uh, since you're t you'd be comparing hours to hours, not dollars to hours. If you look on the very first slide, uh, not Rick's, but the, other, the very first slide of the presentation. Yeah, let's go kill that one real quick. Uh, see, like the that. second last bullet, scaffold labor costs, those are dollars, can range from 18 to 40% of the work hours. I think what you're trying to say is scaffold hours can range 18 to 40 of the total direct work hours. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So it's hours yep. to hours. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, pardon me. Yes, that, that is that is correct. Yep. We we talk about cost the cost of hours, but yes, then, <clears throat> um, we, ideally we would compare hours to hours. 
Yeah, correct. Okay, that's the only point I'm trying to, because that's typically what we look at is the range of scaffold hour direct uh, scaffold hours to overall hours. Since the hourly rate for some mechanical trades, the hourly rates for scaffold may be different. It won't be linear on the dollars, but the hours are one to one. That's that's all I was trying to clarify. Yes, good point. Hey, um, while we got you on the phone there, John, what's uh, what's uh, do you have a normal average for what you uh, expect for scaffold cost? You know. Oh. That's that's a real interesting question, and that's one of the reasons I was looking at it. Um, you know, we we have historical data, and we talk to clients about it, and they're they're typically. It's, I'll put it this way: sometimes their percentage for scaffold out of total direct hours is one fourth of what we think it should be, and <laughs> and we've had these discussions with them. You know, as a, as a rule of thumb, sometimes we throw 20, 22% in at a conceptual stage. And we're, have, we're in discussions with clients that think it needs to be at 5% or 10%. And, and that's always a, a point that we always end up um, trying to, you know, address and sort out. You know, and, and the data that y'all presented today, it's excellent stuff. I wish more people did it. Um, and the other thing that it brings to the table is all the historical data to substantiate it mathematically. You know, I'm kind of a numbers guy and I always say at the end of the day, what do the numbers tell me? And the numbers tell the story, no matter what anybody's opinion is or all that. So I, I'm a numbers guy and that's why I focus so much on trying not to mix dollars to hours and just keep it straight. So it's a very, very good presentation, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Um, so, uh, we've got a couple more questions here, actually. Um, uh, lots of focus here on, on the hours used in the field. Has experience shown how much of these savings need to be transferred to the upfront planning? Increase of X percentage of additional upfront versus Y percentage savings in the field. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Would, uh, so Jeff, I guess, I'll, let you, I'll let, you, yeah. let you start, Jeff, and then I'll tag on the end again. I think that works good, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess um, my take on that is the sort of an overall uh, understanding. If we know that, and uh, let's use John's numbers now. So uh, if we know, you know, as a safe place, we start with 22% as our buff, uh, as our uh, scaffold budget, but we know uh, when everything gets organized, we're going to come in at 17 and uh, 17 or, or maybe even 15% um, uh, should we make that adjustment in the budget um, uh, Before we get started. So of course um, You know, there's there's some um, Inherent value in just hitting your targets saying you're going to do 18% and hitting 18% um, and I know that, uh, you know, if we say we're going to do 20%, we come in at, at 17, it sounds good, except that the cost guys will tell you, well, hey, but we had that money tied up. And, you know, if you had been more accurate, you know, we, we didn't have to tie up that fund. So, you know, then um, I guess I would ask um, if we set stretch targets, so if we say that our scaffold budget is going to be 15%, does that actually help us improve our productivity? Um, because we have a stretch target to meet and um, sometimes the answer is uh, yes uh, but uh, I think that most often the influence on that is not about hitting targets it is just about being um, uh, effective so uh, so anyway I think that we should transfer uh, some of those savings into the original budget so that means that instead of uh, scheduling at 22 percent or budgeting at 22 percent we should be budgeting at 18 percent uh, because that uh, sort of tells the project that we have an expectation that we are going to manage at um, uh, an AWP level and we are going to achieve standard rates. So here, here's here's my take on it. I think the question, I have a little different spin on it, but uh, similar. Um, the question to me was, hey, this upfront planning, does it really pay off? What's the ROI on that? And I think AWP's looked at uh, numerous different projects to say every engineer that I had gives me some ROI, and that's five to 10 for one ROI. Um, 
Depending on the nature of the project, the size and scope, are you using full-blown AWP systems like Bentley Construct Sim, um, what's the level of complexity, et cetera, determines how many people and how many roles uh, have to put in early. For our work, it's typically, you know, people try to, try to say, I can't pay for one, two, or three people to be in the front. What I would argue is it's usually somewhere around a couple of folks from the scaffold scaffold craft perspective um, that, that participate. And those roles are uh, someone to run the tools, someone to be part of the interface with all the other users, uh, and then some seasoned access SME to validate the concepts that have been proposed to provide the access. Can I really build that scaffold that way as an example? The, the results out the back end are, are good. <laughs> so. I would, I would tell you that uh, the job that I showed the charts on, uh, I'm trying to do the math here, uh, we spent uh, less than 1%, right at 1% or 2% uh, to achieve those savings, uh, which to me could have been several million dollars. So I, I don't want to exaggerate the ROI. That job was a couple hundred to one ROI for some upfront planning resources and deliver AWP, WFP results on the back end. The other point I would make is purely evaluating uh, the cost of scaffold is great, but there's also a huge, I would say, just as big an opportunity of value for the non scaffold crafts. Because if you're involved in projects, you know how much waste and standby for welders, uh, heat treatment people, et cetera, that aren't baked into the scaffold plan, someone's paying for those people on timesheets. Both those buckets of value uh, are cultivated when you do some upfront planning, AWP for scaffold. Hope that answers. Excellent. Um, we did have a couple more questions, but we are uh, one minute to the end of the hour here. So I think what we'll do is we'll post the link to the recording on the Advanced Work Packaging and Workface Planning Networking Group on LinkedIn. And uh, we'll post the, the additional questions there and, and perhaps uh, we can have uh, have the group discuss it and, and uh, maybe maybe uh, Jeff and or, and or Rick could possibly address those questions uh, over there. Um, awesome Q&A though, uh, really appreciate the questions and uh, the thoughtful responses. These are the kinds of questions and conversations that happen at the AWP conference. Uh, you'll be able to find Brand Safeway at the AWP conference in our breakout program and uh, they'll have a, a booth in our, our main ballroom as well. Insight AWP, also a breakout level sponsor. You'll find them in the breakout program. Um, both of these presenters will be in our implementation support track. Uh, the, the, um, the calendar of events isn't finalized yet, but that will be available as soon as possible at awpconference.com. And that's where you can find all the information about the conference. Um, again, it's October 2nd and 3rd, 2018, down in Houston, Texas, uh, presented by Group ASI. We are an AWP implementation support services company. We do business globally, and we've been presenting the uh, AWP and WFP conferences since 2009. So again, thank you to Jeff. Thank you to Rick, um, as, as always, for your ongoing support of the conference, as well as for presenting in our webinar series here today. Thanks for all the attendees. Uh, thanks to the, all the attendees for signing up and, and um, jumping online this morning to spend some time with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in Houston in October at the conference. Um, any final comments from the presenters? Or? No, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you. Great. Yeah, same for me. Uh, thanks Steve for hosting this and uh, thanks Rick. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys at the conference. Excellent. Thank you. Have a great day.